Jeremiah chapter 50. That's where we find ourselves. Jeremiah chapter 50. We're talking about our series, Babylon is Fallen. And this evening we have uh, part two of Babylon is Fallen. So Jeremiah chapter 50, and we're going to pick it up in verse 17. Glad you guys could make it out again tonight. It's a beautiful warm evening. Summer, they tell me, is here. The wind season is over with. How many of you guys are glad that the winds are gone? <laughs> yeah, it could be pretty brutal. All right, let's go before the Lord. Father God, once again, we just want to thank you for giving us an opportunity to open up our Bibles, Lord, and at this time to hear from you, Lord, to remember what you've done, Lord, in the past. For we serve the same God. You're the God of yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. And so lessons to be learned from the past, Lord. Gosh, we want to make observations on that, Lord, that we might never go that way, Lord. But, Lord, we see your justice in it all, Lord. Your love for Israel and your care for them, Lord, and how you are the God of vengeance. And it's not us, but it's you. And yet, Lord, when we are out there, Lord, and we deserve to be uh, punished, Lord, you have mercy on us, Lord. And you think about us. and You want us home to be with you. So, Lord, if uh, any backsliders are listening tonight, Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts and bring them home, Lord. If there's someone that's new and just doesn't have hope in their life, Lord, I trust that they would find their trust and hope in you, Jesus. So speak to us through your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, be our teacher once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we started to read and we started to learn about the fall of Babylon. And yes, God... Uh, used her to discipline Judah, but when one is cruel and vicious, just because you can be, it is sin for us. Remember that. So as we begun chapter 50 uh, with God declaring war on Babylon, uh, cha in chapters 50 and 51, again, God speaks to the prophet Jeremiah. He speaks to the Jews, then he speaks to Babylon itself, and he even speaks to an invading army. You know how we say, charge, go get them, and this and that. Well, the Lord gives a charge, specific instructions to Babylon, to, I mean, the army that's invading Babylon, to completely destroy her, to take her apart, to take all those riches that they stored in about every city you can imagine. Remember, Babylon was the first world empire, and so it conquered many people. So there's many people living in Babylon that aren't necessarily born and bred Babylonian, but the peoples that they conquered, such as uh, Judah, and they took them to be with them. Uh, there are many people, so it's a mix. It's a potpourri of serving idols, serving other gods, <clears throat> and God had had his full fill with them. They had more than done what he had asked them to do, and now they had a joy in just destroying people's lives. And so the Lord would avenge his own, and we're going to see some of that tonight. So again, we've reached uh, verses 17. Uh, and through verse 20, we see God will speak about the Jews. So let's pick it up in verse 17. Israel is like scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria devoured him. Now, at last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. So it's interesting, church. Uh, interesting that God has always compared his people like sheep. How many of you can bear? Man, right? We are the sheep. We are his sheep. And sheep have, have always been how God compares his people, right? So we're familiar with the image of God's people being like sheep. And here, the Lord sees them as scattered. When sheep scatter, when any animal scatters, but especially sheep, it's not a good thing. So again, here, the Lord sees them as scattered sheep. So God's heart hurts when he sees and he knows that his people, be it Yesterday or even today, he hurts when his kids are scattered. Now, you and I perhaps don't see ourselves as scattered sheep, right? You're saying, well, I'm not a scattered sheep and blah, blah, blah. But look at it from heaven's perspective. When God sees Christian dung, he sees, oh, there are the Assemblies of God church over there. And there is a, not one or two, but several Baptist churches over here. And then there's a Calvary Chapel over here. And then there's a... Anglican Church and, and, and Nazarene Church. And, and, and sometimes we haven't been that good to one another. Sometimes we don't see ourselves as God sees us as his sheep. And so we can say that from God's perspective, oh my gosh, my kids are scattered. Aren't you glad for heaven that there's no more stinky badges? 
and that all of us who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb were going to be together in heaven. No more, uh, I'm here, and I'm from this, I'm from, we're just here because of Jesus, amen? It's going to be a good time in heaven, but sometimes here on the earth, guys, we need to learn that if another person, though he worships here, he doesn't worship here, if he is washed in the blood of the Lamb, if he is a Christian and he walks and talks like a duck quacks and swims on water, a duck is a duck and a Christian is a Christian, and, and you and I are to be pleasant to them, whenever we can be. Well, here, back in the day, they're all Jews, and they have scattered. And they have scattered, and he said, because these lions came against them. And so the lions are a, is a term, a title for, uh, he uses it for Assyria and now Babylon. These bullies, if you may, have come and pounced on his people. And God's heart, God's heart, again, hurts for them, right? So in context, uh, they had devoured God's sheep. Assyria and Babylon had, had driven them away. So what God shows here, and, and, and take heart from this, is that God is not deaf to the cries of his people. God is not blind to see what is going on with them, how you're being treated. Uh, that is true for them back then, and it's true for us today. God is not deaf to your calling upon him because you need him. In fact, prayers are heard by the Lord. And, and we're, again, as we study on Sunday, we're going to see that their offerings as incense before the Lord is the prayers of the saints, his people. So God hears you. Going through a tough time right now, God hears you. Uh, changing employers because you have to, God sees it. He's, he's sensitive to that. He knows about that. And, and he's uh, not blind to your suffering. So he still, and, and Israel here, his people, I mean, they had turned their backs on the Lord. We've read where they had altars almost on every boulevard and things like that. They were behaving even worse than the pagans, but God still has a heart for them, and he still has a heart for us. And that's the neat thing about our God. He doesn't change, and he cares for us. Verse 18, look at your Bible. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts. Host, again, means the God of the armies. Thus, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land. As I have punished the king of Assyria, not only does God punish the people, its leadership, but he also punishes that land there. And guess what? Here's something that we're going to see in just a second. Even the horses are to be slaughtered. And you would say, but my goodness, Flicka never did anything wrong. For those of you that remember my friend Flicka, right? Uh, why are they to blame? Well, how many of you guys know that there's some demon-possessed horses out there, you know? And there's this and that. And living in that land, living... Uh, uh, being a part of this, being always used for evil, not good, something happens to the animal kingdom as well. Not all dogs that you take from the, that you save a dog and you take them from the pound are going to be good dogs because they've been exposed to some pretty bad things. And, and some dogs just will turn on you as they turned on people, and that's why they're in the pound sometimes. And so understand this about the animal kingdom, that the Lord, especially as we'll read right now, he has the people that he's going to use to come against Babylon, destroy them all. You and I don't always understand as to why, but trust the Lord. Learn to trust God and what he shares with you and the way he leads you. His ways are narrow, I understand. It doesn't, he doesn't happen to be changed by the culture. His ways are the narrow way, the straight path, but the end is heaven for us. And sometimes things, you know, we just don't understand, just Give it to the Lord. Our brain is like a BB compared to his that is infinite, right? We're just real small in, in what we, even if we think we're all that great. So, again, I will punish the king of Babylon, his land, and I, as I have punished the king of Assyria. So, once again, we read and thus are informed that vengeance belongs to the Lord. When God says, I will punish, trust him on that. He will take care of your foes, your enemies. Uh, it belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. He is the one who does the punishes. Uh, he's done it before. He will do it again. So once again, note to self as I read this. Note to self. Commit those who have wronged you or those who perhaps are still wronging you. Commit them to the Lord. Don't start devising schemes and plans on how we're going to pay them back. Oh, payback, we say. That doesn't uh, befit us who are God's kids on the earth. God knows it all. And if you have to suffer one and, and uh, loss, if you have to turn the cheek, 
Do it for your master's sake. That's how he led by example. And that's always a lesson for us. We need to follow his lead. Again, he sees and he certainly hears your prayer. So trust him. Look at verse 19. But I will bring back Israel to his home. And he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan. His soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought, but there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, but they shall not be found, for I will pardon those whom I preserve. Listen, here in speaking about the Jews, God says in verse 19 that he would bring his people back into their own land. They have been scattered about, right? But he's going to bring them back home uh, where the flocks may graze safely, where the flocks might be, live in peace. No one's harassing them. And so he sees that and he promises that. I'm, I'm telling you, church, this is a great promise that God gives his people then. Now, think how encouraging uh, this would be when God's people would be reminded of this after finding themselves in a foreign country for a while. Oh, man, why are you bumming out? Wow, it seems like there's no hope. There's no hope for tomorrow. God promised to his work. He said to the prophet Jeremiah that he's going to bring us back, that we're going to be able to rejoice again. I pray, and sincerely I pray, that you yourself will never be removed from what we call home, right, uh, and be found yourself in a foreign land. I, serving in the military, found myself in a foreign land, and I was gone 18 months from the USA. And I got to tell you, when my plane landed in um, uh, Fort Dix, I, when I, went, I came back and uh, processed, out processed from the military from Fort Dix, New Jersey, but when I landed on America, I wasn't the only one that was kissing the, the concrete uh, runway. There was many a soldier that was coming back and just grateful to be back in America. And if you talk to a POW or you talk to someone that's been away for years, mistreated, spoken to in a foreign language, and, and you don't know what they say and they expect you to obey, and if you don't, they're shooting you or doing this and that, it is a privilege to come home. And so what God is saying to his people, I know you've been scattered and, you know, he punished them and allowed that to happen. But hear these promises about being able to come home, to being able to be in your own country where they speak your language, uh, it's, it's a blessing. Uh, we've taken it for granted much too long, the West has, because we have not had war on our, on our soils, really. When we said that 9-11 uh, was the enemy has brought it to us, that's the beginning of uh, something that's probably going to happen in the future. But for the last few years, we have not experienced again, and for hundreds of years, really, war that has come from another country. We know what the word says. We know that the Bible doesn't mention America in the latter days. And I pray it's because most of us have been raptured and we're gone. And the remnant that is left is going to somehow assimilate into or try to survive or whatever. Uh, but the whole thing about uh, our world and the way it's going, you can see that they want to remove nationalism. They don't want you to say I'm an American. They want you to say that I'm part of the new world order or whatever. Uh, so God have mercy on them there. But back to our context, these promises being made by the Lord that you will be able to come back, that is great stuff. That is great stuff to hear from the Lord. Uh, from verse 20, again, we see the two horizons of prophecy again. So God allowed Jeremiah to look down into the latter days when God would wipe away the nation of Israel's sins and establish his new covenant with them. That is something that is, is glorious you and I know, and we read it, right? For I will pardon those whom I preserve. Raise your hand if you know you've been saved and washed by the blood of Jesus, right? Uh, you're a Christian. Raise your hand. So because you have been, God says, I will preserve you. And, and so we will go through tribulations, guys. We're going to go through trials and whatnot while we're here on the earth. But understand that God preserves those who are his. And so because you worship the Lord, because you're in the word, because you do whatever you can in your Christian life to honor the Lord, you pray to him, you thank him for your blessings, he will preserve you, and when he comes to his church, we are gone, and we'll be with him forever, and we'll remember, we'll remember, yes, we had a hard time on earth, but the Lord preserved me and brought me through. So preservation is a good thing. Uh, I don't know about you, but I love that jams and jellies have preservatives on it and peanut butter. 
because six months later, I'm still opening those things, and sometimes it's been a year. My daughter, Andrew, goes to the house all the time and gets rid of our old stuff. But Judy and I, man, we, do, we love that strawberry jam, and yeah, we don't care if it's a year old. It's still in the fridge. It opens up. It's sweet as we can be. But like a good preservative, God will preserve you and I for eternity. And so we, we see this already happening in times past. Now, church, Again, be encouraged for soon and very soon we're going to be with the Lord forever. And we'll come back. We'll come back to the earth and ring with him for how many years? Ten? For a, in the earth. How long will we be on the earth with him? One thousand years. The millennium, right? So we're going to be able to enjoy this earth, this tierra firme that we stand on and whatnot. It is going to be a good thing for us. All right. We get to our next verses, beginning 21. God speaks to the invaders. Right? To the invaders. It's like having a pep talk for those who are going to do the attacking. And what does he say to them? Verse 21. Go up against the land of Merathon, against it, and against the inhabitants of Picad. Waste and utterly destroy them, says the Lord, and do according to all that I have commanded you. Church, this is a command. Now, the city, Merathon and Picad, they were ancient Babylonian cities. And they would be typical cities in which God would have his invaders come and invade. And, and what are they doing? Are they warning them? No, I don't see give them a warning. Are they, is he asking them to surrender? God's not asking that, right? Look at his order. He's, he, I want you to waste and utterly destroy them. Church, in those days, they didn't have bombs. They didn't, they're not dropping bombs on them. They're not setting up the, the famous Claymore mine that we learned how to arm and have it point against your enemy and tripwire make it go out. <clears throat> They're not firing bazookas at these guys, right? It was attack by the sword. The instrument of war was attacking by the sword or arrow shooting. And when the Lord says, I want you to uh, waste and utterly destroy them, that's hand-to-hand -hand combat. That is in their face and having no mercy and slicing and dicing and killing, going for the kill. So this is a horrific order to come. But then again, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's easy for us to look and say, oh, my gosh, that's cruel. But were you there when the Babylonians were mistreating people, especially his people? Were you there when uh, they could barely, the husband would barely bring a little bit of food home to the wife and two kids, and the Babylonians would come in and take half of it or three quarters away, or just give them a handful and watching the kids starve? Were you there when it was cold and the kids didn't have something, and somehow mom and dad managed to put a little fleece over the child like a blanket, and the Babylonian would come and take it away? Remember, these people went above and beyond what God called them to do. And so the people cried. And they prayed and said, Lord, don't you see what's happening to me and my family? Sometimes today we see atrocities go on and say, Lord, don't you see this? God sees and he hears our prayers. And when vengeance comes, he wants you to know that it comes. Because he doesn't forget. He sees and he, he's out to be the great avenger of his people and what they've done. So it's a tough thing when we see this. 22. A sound of battle is in the land. And of a great destruction, how the hammer of the whole earth has been cut apart and broken. How Babylon has become a desolation among the nations. So, again, Babylon, the first world, world empire, they said it will never. How could it? I, you know, who's going to come and take us off our throne? It's like any empire that, that, that raises up and says, who's going to take us down? England was one, right? And the United States has been of lately, who's going to take us down? But we see the United States because we're here. And we see how the agenda is to go against the things that God loves. The world all of a sudden hates. The world all of a sudden wants to change things. And, and we're talking about just America. So how could God not deal with America? Thank goodness you and I have not been called to wrath. And the Lord's going to take us out of here in the rapture. But what's, what's left of the world, it's going to be a very difficult time. So here, again, Babylon being the first world empire, they thought of no how, no way will we ever stop being number one. They were, as Jeremiah describes here, they were the, the hammer of the whole earth. 
a hammer in true church. No one could, but God. God can. He cut them in pieces, it says, and broke them. Pretty much like you and I cut up an old credit card. Remember your first credit cards? They tell you to get rid of them. It's over with. And what did you do? Man, we shred them. We cut them three ways, four ways, and whatnot. We don't want no one to know our stuff, right? And, and so this is what God would do, has prophesied he would do against Babylon. And he will do again to the nation. So they became a desolation among the nations. So what does that mean? Well, you can't thrive there anymore. Can't do this and that. And I love, one thing I love about uh, where we live at is that we could take the old roads up here in the back on our Jeeps or whatever, and sometimes using bigger cars, and see the old mining towns, the ghost towns, right? Here, he is saying Babylon is going to become like a ghost town. And that's what um, desolation among the nations. The nation would pass by, and they said, can you believe this was Babylon, the hammer? The one that had everybody, you know, falling at their knees, people begging for their lives? God has destroyed them, would destroy them. They would become a ghost town. 24, look at your Bible. God says, I have laid a snare for you. You have indeed been trapped, O Babylon, and you were not aware. You have been found and also caught because you have contended. That's a big word there. You have contended against the Lord. So, church, God did this. He allowed this to happen because they contended against him so let this be a lesson to be learned not that you and i will but babylon did hollywood does today the world does they contend against the lord they they are in competition and they want to say we are greater than god Our, we're going to do better than god and so they're like in a competition but they contend against the lord babylon was full of pride and they gave glory and honor and, and made famous their idols, right? They worshiped them. Today, our cities, our states, our country as a whole dishonors God. It does. Like Babylon, some countries think that they are invincible and some countries are even itching to try and prove this. This whole thing about Russia coming against Ukraine, how is Ukraine going to? defend themselves against Russia. We all know they've done a pretty darn good job, you know, but uh, uh, it's not a good thing to be that prideful person and think that you and your country are, are going to do all of this, you know. So some of them are itching to prove it. Some of them, those that are itching are those that want to get their, their hands on nuclear bombs. They just want to let them go and see what happens. On a personal level for you and I, as we see countries doing this, as Babylon did, and that's why the Lord uh, brought him down because they contended against him. So on a personal level, when we think about this, how about me, myself, and I? Well, number one, I need to keep myself humble before the Lord. How many of you guys have remember reading or have heard, humble yourself before the Lord, right? And he will lift you up. To humble yourself is not an easy thing. It's going against the flesh. To be content with being second, to be content with eating last, to be content with uh, let someone else receive the blessing and, and whatnot. That's, that's a, a, a process that we do that God, again, sees. He sees the bad, but he also sees the good. And he tells us because we're not, we're in this flesh, and it's kind of hard for us to humble ourselves sometimes. But he says to us, humble yourself, guys. And then we see it as a nation. Nations didn't humble themselves. And so how God deals with them. By us not humbling ourselves, we are contending with the Lord as well. We're saying that we are the man, or we are the woman, or it, I deserve this, or I deserve that. And that we don't deserve anything. We're, we're, we have what we have because of the Lord's goodness and kindness to us. Most of us know that if it wasn't for the Lord, things could have gone awful wrong in our lives. But here we are, right? So to humble ourselves is a good thing, and he calls us to do that. So obey his word. And honor what he honors. The results will be peace and blessing in today's messed up world. In today's world that is messed up. You know, I, I talk to some Christians here and there, and uh, they're rejoicing. How's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. You know, uh, and I talk to others. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe how bad things are. Did you read? Did you hear? Did you do that? It's been, it's been pretty bad in the world. But in this messed up world, the Lord still blesses you. 
He gives you peace, right? And it's a great place to be when we are in his hands. And that's where we want to be. We want to humble ourselves and be there. All right. 25. The Lord has opened his armory. Could you imagine? We all know what an armory is. If you've never visited the National Guard here in Montrose, uh, as you start driving up, you'll see sometimes tanks and different weapons and whatnot. And some armories are bigger in, in, in other places. But to have all your weapons and things like that, I just uh, did a funeral up at the, um, the Veterans Cemetery in Grand Junction this week. Um, this last week and uh, the armory is right next to it and if you look from where you're at at the cemetery there if you look over to the armory you'll see a helicopter up there so armories have weapons and equipment used for war God has his own armory and that's what we're reading here it says the Lord has opened his armory and has brought out the weapons of his indignation for this is the work of the Lord of the work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. All right. So we're going to ch- check this out. Come against her from the farthest borders. Again, he's speaking to those armies, the Medes and the Persians, of course, that would come as Daniel prophesied and would take Babylon down. But what these guys did was was something amazing. We'll talk about that in just a second. It says come against her from the farthest border. Open her storehouses. What that means is Babylon, again, they captured so many people. They had storehouses and this and that. And almost every little city, precinct, they were rich with what they had stolen and gained for themselves from other countries. Right? They had conquered. And so they had the stuff. The Lord says, open up her storehouses. Cast her up as heaps of ruins and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left. Whoa. That's, that's a tall order, right? But that's what God had commanded them to do. Slay all her bulls. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe to them, for their day has come, the time of their punishment. We talked about God laying a trap. When God lays a trap, you can believe that he is going to be successful as a trapper. Babylon would be caught in God's trap and would not be able to escape his weapons, not his weapons. Church, young men and young women go to war because we old folk can't go there anymore. <laughs> I don't think we old folk can uh, get past basic training anymore. I just don't think we can, right? It is the glory of a country to have young men and women to defend their nation. That is glorious for any country that has many youth, much youth, right? Again, you see how we're working against ourselves by... Uh, Abortion and things like that. Killing the babies that would be our, our generations of tomorrow. We're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We don't see it, but that's not you and I. But I mean, the world doesn't see it. Um, America doesn't see that in sin. However, when the battle is against the Lord, the young men and women, as strong as they might be, as apt, as careful as they might be, as smart as they might be, when they're against the Lord, Young men and young women will be slaughtered. They will be slaughtered, as it says here. Slaughtered like cattle. Here in these verses, it is evident that the day of judgment has come for Babylon. She is done. Her time is over with. Daniel prophesied that, Babylon, you are the head of gold. And after you comes, right, shoulders and chest of silver. And, and, and so this is what's happening. Her time is done. Judgment has come. And now, God, the Jewish remnant speaks. Those that are left, behind, uh, that are left, that are running, that are, are, God has told them to flee. They're fleeing. Where are they going to go? They're going to go to try and get back to home, back to Israel, right? 28. The voice of those who flee and escape from the land of Babylon declares in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God. The vengeance of his temple. So, the Jerusalem Times, the Jerusalem Times, or if it was happening here in Montrose, we would say the Montrose Daily Press, but more so, more modern, would be the Montrose Message Board on Facebook, would be hearing and posting verbatim, right, from the escapees who had fled that war zone and escaped to Judah. And they would be saying, Babylon is fallen. You guys need to know that Babylon is fallen. And they would be saying, because it was really a big deal to them. Remember, what did Babylon do that no other country had done to Israel? They burned her down. 
They burned down her gates. They burned the temple down. So when you read here, um, they come to, uh, uh, Babylon declares, declares in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. What they're saying is, part of this whole thing is because these guys came out here and when they took us away in, in these three different um, uh, exoduses from, from Jerusalem, uh, they, they burned down the temple. I mean, these guys were vicious. Again, they went past what God had used them as his vessel to punish Judah, yes, but when that, that vessel all of a sudden thinks they're all high and mighty, which Babylon did, they did and went beyond their scope of what they're called, they've been called to do. So they burned down the temple, and it's mentioned here. Interesting how the Lord says, I don't want nothing standing. When you come against her now, against Babylon, because he's judging them, don't leave nothing. Wipe her out completely. So now God gathers the armies against Babylon. Um, verse 29, call together the archers against Babylon. All you who bend the bow, encamp against it all around. Let none of them escape. Repay her according to her work, <coughs> according to all she has done. Do to her, for she has been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. Church, it would be wise and certainly self-preserving or for self-preservation for anyone contemplating in their minds to go against Israel, right? To go against her. Uh, they should read and learn and believe God's words. So let's talk about that for just a second. The Bible says that all will turn against Israel. So the U.S. is part of the all. It doesn't say except the United States of America. If you go against Israel, all you have to do is go back in time, look through these pages, and see what's happened to every nation that's gone against the apple of God's eye. Now, the Lord has allowed for some. He did allow Assyria. He did allow Babylon to do their thing. But that's, that's, let God take care of his business his way. Now, for a country, for the United States to declare that we are going to go after Israel, trust me, God will be involved and he's going to deal with us. If, if it just went that way, if a country does that. Russia, we know Russia's going to do it. We know that uh, what's happening in Ezekiel 38, you know, 37, 38, and we'll get to that one, and it's one of our next books. Then well, we have Lamentations, then we'll go into Ezekiel, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But those are countries that have gone against Israel. Now let's bring it down to you and I as individuals. Watch your thoughts, guard your heart, certainly watch your tongue, to speak against Israel and the Jews. Be careful you don't get caught up in that. When I was in elementary school, I remember uh, the guys, you know, uh, in East Los Angeles, we used to call the Jews Christ killers. You know, who wants to be part of a Jewish friend? We didn't have Jewish friends, you know, there wasn't. And there, I'm sure they were all around. There was Rabinowitz every once in a while, you run into someone, right? But thank God for Sunday school teachers that would remind us, hey, watch your tongue against that Jesus uh, was a Jew. Don't get taken into conversations. Uh, in these last days, as we continue to go, people are going to be more and more against the Jewish people. It, it's, it's already happening. It's not the, the frog doesn't go into the water when it's boiling hot. Remember, it dies and it boils when they, they've turned up the heat just a little bit at a time. So guard your heart. Have your antennas up. You shouldn't be against any people. We should be praying for all of them, right? But specifically, specifically, the rhetoric's going to come against the Jewish people. And, and you and I need to be prepared ahead of time. We need to be prepared. I'm not going to go there. If the three guys at the, at the office drinking fountain start saying, well, you know, I heard this about the Jews. These dumb Jews, they're new. You know, don't go there. The Lord says to us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and that the Lord is going to bring them back into the land. They're his people. God's going to deal with them. So therefore, adjust your heart. If your heart is hard against the Jewish people, ask the Lord, Lord, would you take your spiritual scalpel and cut out this piece of my heart and, and heal it again? Or give me a heart of flesh, Lord, that you could mold and stuff. You know, not a stone heart that I'm, I'm set in my ways. So it's, it's a good thing for us. But because Babylon was uh, against the Lord, right, it says, verse 30, her young men shall fall in the streets, and all her men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord. Church, again, God called the archers, right? 
and ordered the armies of the Medes and the Persians to shoot and kill and allow no one to escape. That's an order, an order from God. Uh, so they weren't hearing God say, hey, I want you to do this. But the prophets say that God would speak to their hearts. And so the commanders and things like that, their hearts would be moved against them. And besides that, they don't, they, no, one, no country that's going to come against Babylon would want to fail and now have Babylon come against them. So you're either all in or, you know, you're already half-stepping and you don't half-step in war. Uh, we learned that from Vietnam. We learned that from uh, other places. When America half-stepped, we never win a war. You know, it, it just goes against us. It's just crazy political stuff that's going on. God here says, when you come down, the Medes and the Persian, they won because they were committed because God was on their side and they were coming and, and there's no way that you want one Babylonian to escape. That's why he says, Shoot them. When they're trying to get away, get rid of them. Don't let it happen. So, um, and now God speaks to Babylon. Verse 31. Behold, I am against you, O most haughty one. Okay, everybody knows what a person who is haughty, what the, how they are. There's these guys that, you know, and you know, they're, they're those kind of people, right? So, behold, I am against you, O most haughty one, says the Lord God of hosts. For your day has come, the time that I will punish you. The most proud shall stumble and fall, and no one will raise him up. I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it will devour all around him. So church, if you have been following our Lord and have been constant in reading his word, then this should not surprise you, right? God tells them that he is against them because of Pride, because of pride. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34, uh, God's word says this, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. So one of the strongest messages in the Bible is the truth that God, in other words, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And it's a message that is so important that, again, it appears three times in Scripture. Here in the Old Testament, Proverbs is number one. But it also appears in the New Testament where James speaks about it. And so does Peter. So it is, it is bad for us or our country to think that they're all it. Right? Not a good thing. So again, church, note to self. Right? Let pridefulness go. Let pridefulness go. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so he doesn't change. What I mean by pridefulness, then again, don't misunderstand that, because some people say, take pride in your work. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing, right? You should do the best that you can. Some people, for whatever reason, just want to make the dollar and, and you know, do less work and make more money, we say, right? Not a good thing. So, yeah, in the things that you do, take pride. God's given you a home. Hey, man, he's giving you a house. You know, put a coat of paint every 25, 35 years. Do something, right? Uh, weed the thing, you know? I mean, I, I, what, well, it's not my property. I'm a renter. Well, is there a little, do you, little path around your house? Maybe you should kind of clean that up, put a little flowers on it, do something. God wants you to, to, to take care of the things that he has entrusted you with. For after all, we're stewards of the things he blesses us with. Now, there was a time where I had pride with my first cars right and i could keep the, i buffed those things and i'd be out all night to see if someone was trying to steal my my car that's the wrong kind of pridefulness right or being prideful and saying you know what i'm gonna max this test and i'm gonna do this and that. or if you're an athlete and you look at the other one dude you might as well not even run this race cause i'm gonna beat you you know that's the wrong kind of prideful pride right so in that we should not be prideful people Oh, my church is bigger than your church. Oh, my church is this and that, even with other Christians, right? We need to be careful because the enemy is sneaky, right? He's sneaky, and, 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 and sin creeps in sometimes, we say. So let's not be prideful people in that respect. In the bad sense, get rid of your pridefulness. And if you need the Lord to help you, just ask him. You think God doesn't want to fulfill his will in you? Absolutely he wants to. Uh, sometimes he say, Lord... Teach me a lesson. You might be in a dangerous place. You might cut your job, cut your car. You know, it's the country and western song. There goes your wife, the dog, the house. I mean, it's just not a good thing. So 
be careful what you ask the Lord for as well. But at the same time, you should get the picture here that these nations that went, we ain't going to get us. God says, man, because you are haughty, because you are this and that, I'm going to destroy you. So, yeah, God hates the proud in that respect, right? Let it go. 33, thus says the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel were oppressed along with the children of Judah. All who took them captive have held them fast. They have refused to let them go. So again, church, God was against them because Babylon had made it a point to make the Jewish people suffer unnecessarily. Unnecessarily. Take away the blanket. Take away the last meal. Uh, take away their salary. Not pay them after you promised to do this and that. They were bad. So again, you look at that, and there has to be, once again, note to self, right? Today, don't be the oppressing boss if you're in charge of people. Don't be the oppressing neighbor, right? Don't, don't, don't go there. Don't be the oppressing family man or family person. Don't hold the people down. Don't punish them unnecessarily. Don't do things that people look at you, man, it is within his power to do this, and they don't do it. You know, Thanksgiving, you think about that. Most of us have turkey dinners. Most of us have leftovers. But if you have a neighbor that, for whatever reason, did not have a turkey dinner, and you're saying, <laughs> serves him right. Watch what I'm going to do. And you take all your leftovers, legs, big old drumsticks and this and that, and, hey, how's it going? And you're just dumping it in front of him without ever having to share. That is unnecessary meanness. And God looks at that, and it's not going to go good for you. Next year, you're the one without the turkey, or you're the one that's lost the job. It's not a good thing. You got 10 cars at home. Neighbor just blew up his engine. He's out there trying to turn it off. You finally get over there with a squirt gun to help him out, you know, turn off the fire. And you don't offer him a car for, for the next day at work? Well, what if he wrecks it? Well, you're insured. Better be, right? Well, what if? Stop it with that. You have 10 cars. Their car just blew up in front of you. And now let's just say she's a mom, a single mom with kids, has to get them to school. Really? You're not going to help them or give up your time or drive them if they mean so much to you? It's not good because if you say, these are my cars. Sorry you don't have yours, you know, and whatnot. This, this is kind of like bad people. There are people like that. Pray that you don't become one of them, and you won't if you keep your heart soft towards the Lord. And so we, we need to do that. Same thing with houses. We have houses, and, and most people uh, do, but every once in a while you run into someone that just needs a place to stay for one night or two. Help them out if you can. You know, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what honors the Lord, not to be the other way around. 34, God says, you know, because you have done this, he says he's going to come back to them, right? But look what 34 says. Their Redeemer, and notice how Redeemer is capitalized. Their re Redeemer is strong. Well, who's their Redeemer? The Lord himself. Jehovah, God is the Redeemer. He is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. So God, God's saying, look, before Babylon was a big bully and everybody was at unrest, but now God's going to turn it around. He's going to have those guys that come out of Babylon, the, his people, and he's going to give their land rest. But Babylon itself, it's going to be in an unrestful state. He'll make problems. And so, so take that personally as well. You're picking on someone, picking on someone. Picking, you think God's not going to bring it to you that you have your own problems? Absolutely so. So we need to look at this and say, mm, Lord, help me not to be that person. Help me. Church, sheep, sheep can't free themselves, right? He says their Redeemer is strong, but their heavenly shepherd could free them, and he would free them. To plead their case speaks like, almost like a, it's a court case, Right? Thus, God, would be, God, he's saying that I'm going to be the defense attorney. I am going to be the judge. And I am going to be the jury because I can do that. And I'm going to find you guilty, Babylon, for everything you've done bad. There's our God. Some of us today know that we couldn't free ourselves from uh, 
from some of the enemies that we have struggled with in life. Some of us from alcohol, some of us from drugs, some of us from just being liars. We couldn't free ourselves, but what did we do? We heard that there was someone that could deliver us, set us free, just as he did for them physically. He could do for us as well as the things we struggle with. We went to him, and the Lord did deliver us. He freed us. He is the great redeemer. What you need to know and what we need to tell, let you know in radio and, and out there is that our God is not dead. As the song says, God's not dead. He is alive, right? Uh, and his son, his name is Jesus, right? And he's still the answer. Christ is the answer for all of us. God still speaking to Babylon told her what to expect on the day of judgment. And that's what we find in verses 35 through 8. So we see a sword that's going to go through the land and cutting down the people of the land. Check this out, 35. A sword is against the Chaldeans, right? That's the Babylonians, says the Lord. Again, the inhabitants of Babylon and against her princes and her wise men, her prince and her wise men. So if it's against the inhabitants of Babylon, that's all the people. A sword is coming against them is what the Lord says. And the, the, the royalty and the wise people, it's coming against them as well. A sword, says 36, is against the soothsayers. Oh, there goes the horoscope people, right? A, a sword is against the soothsayers, and they will be fools. A sword is against her mighty men, and they will be dismayed. Nothing like a strong man that can't beat the competition, can't lift, can't do this or that, right? They will be dismayed. A sword is against their horses. I shared with you, I would come back to that. Against their chariots. And against all the mixed people who are in her midst. And they will become like women. Now, church, God is not against women, nor is he putting them down. In this century, again, there was no rules for war. And there was no uh, grenades being launched or rockets shooting in. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. War was brutal, vicious. It was without mercy. And most women, upon invasion or hearing about that there's going to be an invasion, would take their kids, their children, and try and find a land where, this, uh, where they could escape to. The point is that the battle would be fierce and come into their neighborhood, into their neighborhoods, right? And it would be the surviving men that would be running and hiding if they could. Second part of 37, a sword is against her treasures, and they will be robbed. Against Babylon was was rich, filthy rich with everything. Uh, conquerors of the world, they were the world empire, so they had everybody's gold and their own. Secondly, verse 38 says, a drought is against her waters and they will be dried up for it is a land of carved images and they are insane with their idols. Church, why drought? Well, because it was the land of carved images and God wanted to show them that their idols were nothing. Nothing at all. 39. Therefore the wild desert beast shall dwell there with the jackals, and the ostriches shall dwell in it. It shall be inhabited no more forever, nor shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, so no one shall reside there, nor son of man dwell in it. We know that after God judged Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone, no one survived in those cities. So, too, it would be in these cities of Babylon, right? Babylon of old would be a place fit only for animals and birds and, and places you, you wouldn't have people there. And now the Lord lets them know from where the army is coming from. 41, behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the ends of the earth. Church, it's not just one army. It's the multitude of them, their kings. So you see, uh, it would be um, Cyrus, right? The Medes and the Persians would come, but they would be getting the other cities that Babylon had done something wrong, and their leaders and whatnot, or their kings, they would also come. So it would be a big army. 42 says, they shall hold the bull and the lance, and they are cruel, and they shall not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea. They shall ride on horses, set in array like a man for battle against you, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon has heard the report about them, and his hands grow feeble 
Anguish has taken hold of him, pangs as of a woman in childbirth. So listen, one can train. You know, one can train and even prepare themselves for war. But when war actually comes to your door, one becomes so scared that it hurts. When the enemy kicks in your neighbor's door and all you can hear is yelling, and you know that your door is next because they're coming down the, if you live in apartments and they're coming down to the next apartment, to the next apartment, and you're next, I'm telling you, you would be scared. You would not know how to defend yourself against that, right? Nothing can prepare you for that shock. Indeed, your whole body shakes uncontrollably. 44. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the floodplain, the thicket. Sometimes we think floodplain and we're thinking just dry land, but in those years, around uh, uh, the rivers and things like that, uh, there was always like a jungle. And the lion, is, when it's hungry for prey, would be coming, creeping up, and then boom, jump. He shall come up like a lion from the floodplain, the thicket of the Jordan against the dwelling place of the strong. But I will make them suddenly run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? Who will arraign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Babylon and his purposes that he has proposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he will make their dwelling place desolate with them. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth trembles and the cry is heard among the nations. Nobody thought that Babylon would ever go down. They just didn't think it until these armies came and they forged a confederacy and here they come 51 verse 1 thus says the lord behold i will raise up against babylon against those who dwell in leb kamai a destroying wind leb kamai literally translated is the midst of those who rise up against me right most regard this as a poetic reference to babylon uh a code word for babylon uh, this thing about codes uh you can't have a code or secret codes against God, no matter if you disguise yourself and say this or that. God knows, right? Um, God is letting them know that no secrets are hidden from him. Here in this last part of verse 1, we read about God raising up a destroying wind. Aren't you glad we have just been through the wind season? Uh, it wasn't that bad, but it, could, it was pretty bad in some places. You know, thank God. And we can only imagine how bad a, quote, destroying wind can be. Yikes. Every time those winds blast against and these thrusts come, I think my house is going to blow away to Kansas or something. Thank God for, I know the builder. Hopefully he'll take care of us. Verse 2, and I will send winnowers to Babylon who shall winnow her empty and empty her land. For in the day of doom, they shall be against her all around. Uh, winnowing is not something that all of us know about, but uh, it's, it's, it's a, a farming method to get rid of the chaff off of the wheat or corn, right? Against her, let the archer bend his bow and lift himself up against her in his armor. Do not spare her, young men. Utterly destroy all her army. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans and those thrust through in her streets. Church, it's, as we close, it's, it's never ever a pretty picture when the Lord decides to uh, punish. When the Lord decides to uh, come against someone, send down his judgment. And, and notice that what he does in details here, it, it's said in detail so that you and I understand that when his judgment comes, it's a complete judgment. Nobody can crawl under a hole. Nobody can do this or that. Saddam Hussein, when he was running, um, went into a hole, and it was just a young uh, um, uh, private, if you may, that uh, discovered him. He says, I am Hussein, 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 uh, leader of, uh, you know, whatever. And the kid says, I am an army private from the U.S. Army. You are under arrest. <laughs> and they pulled them out and, and took him. Something like that, right? So the details here, and it's gory because God wants to let you know is that he's not going to miss a thing. He's going to take care of it all. Now, in that, I want to encourage all of you to keep the faith, man. You serve a living God, and he's going to preserve you. Don't get tired of doing good for people. You know, don't let your love grow cold in that you're, you're only being good to people who you think, you know, are the best of people and could do something for you. Don't let your love grow cold. 
Continue doing these things he's called you to do. Put yourself out there for his name's sake. God will bless you for it. Father God, we just want to thank you for your word up to this point, Lord. We see that Babylon for sure is falling and has f- fallen, Lord, as you start speaking, because what you prophesy is as good as true. And Lord, there are lessons for us, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that, that we might glean from the scriptures uh, applications for our own life, Lord. We've read a lot, we've heard a lot, Lord. Help us learn as well. We give you the rest of this evening, Lord. Be with us the rest of this week, and we look forward to coming together on Saturday, on Sunday, where we continue in the book of Revelation. Be with my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the miracles, Lord. I've seen the Hernandez family here tonight, Lord, as well. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.